My name's Phoebe Watkins. I'm going to be chairing tonight's uh, meeting. I'm a Unison member in Camden Unison, the local branch of the local government union um, and the convener of the adult social care department there. I'm also a member of the SWP in Camden branch. I'm really, really pleased to be chairing to me tonight's meeting, uh, which is Tarek Ali speaking on Afghanistan to Pakistan on the flight path of American power. Um, Tarek Ali is a very well-known writer, filmmaker and well-known political activist. Um, he will actually be doing a book signing at the end of the meeting, um, but I'd like to introduce Tarek to speak about 35 minutes and then we'll open it up to the floor for discussion. Okay. Dear friends, when this century began, there was a lot of talk in the media, amongst the political classes, the rulers of this world, that we were now entering a world without conflict. That's what they said. Books were written about it and that therefore the only thing for people to do was to relax and be happy because liberal democracy had won its last battles, communism, the idea of any alternative whatsoever had collapsed and there was nothing else to do except lie down, enjoy the good life and it was pointed out that only people incredibly crazy were still talking about the necessity to fight back, to resist, to create alternatives. That rhetoric has more or less disappeared. And the reason it's disappeared is as follows. That the big mistake that was made by many liberals and left social democrats, liberal left, if you like, globally, was that because communism had collapsed in the 90s, for some reason, psychologically, wish fulfillment, I don't know what, they assumed that imperialism had also collapsed and that the United States, because of the collapse of communism, was no longer the same power it used to be. Well, it's true. It isn't the same power it used to be. It became stronger. And it continued to discuss and determine how its power and hegemony should be exercised on the globe. So now, 10 years into the century, or just under 10 years into the century, we have two countries occupied, wars wa raging and wars being waged. One is, of course, Iraq, and the other is Afghanistan. Less talked about less familiar, but the latest statistics show that for the last two months now, the casualties of occupying armies in Afghanistan have been higher than in Iraq. The number of civilians being killed in Afghanistan over the last four weeks is more than in Iraq. And so this war which the world sought to ignore apart from tiny minorities, because while on Iraq we had massive mobilizations on Afghanistan, there were hardly any mobilizations at all. There was one big one in London, more than one, one in Berlin, and that was about it. The mobilizations against the Afghan war were very limited, and now we pay up, not us personally, but the movement, pays a price for this because this is where the United States, the big debate now going on in the United States is how to solve the problem of Afghanistan. <clears throat> and to understand that, uh, one has to see what exactly has happened in Afghanistan. Many people felt that when Afghanistan was invaded, uh, we were somehow going to see the emergence of a democratic government. Mrs. Blair and Mrs. Bush went on television and radio and said that this was a war to liberate women. 
And I remember saying in response at that time in the United States that if this was a war to liberate women, it would certainly be a first in world history, an imperial war designed to liberate any segment of the population, but we would wait and see. Well, the number of rapes has gone up. Brothels in Afghanistan have multiplied by 2,000 because the foreign occupying armies have to be serviced. Prostitution has increased. Uh, the war went extremely badly because their war aims were limited. L let's remember what they were. To capture Osama bin Laden, dead or alive, to capture Mullah Omar, dead or alive, and to overthrow the Taliban. Well, the overthrow of the Taliban wasn't a problem because they didn't fight back. A chunk of them went into the mountains, and the others were told by the Pakistani military, who were their big backers, not to fight back. Said, it's foolish, you'll just get killed, leave. If necessary, shave off your beards, hide, go to Pakistan, do what you want. Don't fight back, you'll be wiped out. Not, not stupid advice, by the way. So they didn't fight. So they took Afghanistan easily and imposed a puppet government and did deals with the leaders of the Northern Alliance in different parts of Afghanistan and thought that would be it. But, you know, that can't be it. Because you now had in Afghanistan dozens of Western troops, the Americans' largest number, the British second, but then little groups from Canada, Germany, Germany, which didn't go into Iraq, sent troops to Afghanistan, France, Afghanistan, Italy, Afghanistan, Spain into Afghanistan, and the new Eastern European satellite states of the United States didn't want to be left behind. So we had token contingents from Czechoslovakia, from Poland, from Romania, from Bulgaria, from the Ukraine, you name it, they are there. The whole of Europe in Afghanistan. <laughs> and now they're realizing that they're, it's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> that they could be killed. And just before the last, have some water, thanks. <clears throat> before the last general election in Spain, um, I went there immediately after the victory of the Socialist Party, and a senior foreign office person told me. He said just before, six months before the election, I was asked by the foreign minister to prepare an exit strategy for Spanish troops from Spain. He said we were preparing it, and suddenly the Americans moved behind the scenes via NATO and said we're going to make the Spanish, the commander-in-chief of the Spanish army, the commander of all NATO forces globally, so it would not be good for NATO if you did what you're preparing to do, which we know. So the Spanish held back, and once they'd held back and decided not to withdraw the troops, of course, the Spanish commander-in-chief never became commander of all the NATO forces. It was a trick and blackmail. But there is unease among some of the European states because they didn't expect they would have to fight. And the reason they are having to fight is that they have imposed on Afghanistan a corrupt regime which relies on gangsterism to maintain control, because they've started killing civilians. Every time you read in the newspapers, for the last two years, 90 Taliban killed, 100 Taliban killed, 50. Just add those figures up. And when you add those figures up, you realize that if this was true, either the Taliban is an organization with unlimited numbers or they've been wiped out four times already. In fact... All the intelligence estimates say that the Taliban are a group of between 10 and 15,000 armed guerrilla fighters. Uh, but they're beginning to get more and more support because of the civilian casualties. And they've also undergone a certain change. 
that most of the people fighting now are seeing the struggle going on as an umbrella. I mean, the Taliban who used to destroy television sets have the most uh, snazzy PR network now with television cameras, interviews, everything. So they're learning too. And one has to understand the circumstances which are also changing them, which is the war that is going on there. So the resistance is mounting. The writ, three different CIA reports over the last three years have pointed out that this regime is useless. That is, a, they're talking about the government they're backing. That with it, they can't go too further. And then guess what? Three attempts have been made to negotiate a deal with the Taliban. One, when Jack Straw, when he was foreign secretary, visited Afghanistan and Pakistan some years ago, and he asked for a secret meeting with the Taliban leadership. They refused. He then met one of the Islamist leaders in Pakistan and said, we need your help uh, to establish contacts with the Taliban. And this guy then went public and said the British Foreign Secretary wants to talk with the Taliban, at which point they all went into reverse gear and told this Islamist leader, why did you go public? We want these talks to be secret. So that's what's going on. NATO, basically Washington, knows this regime can't last and have been trying to drag the Taliban into a coalition government with Karzai, And they are refusing. Why do they refuse? Because they know they are finished. So their response has been consistent. They're saying, we will discuss coalition governments with anyone after every single foreign soldier has left our country. Then we will talk. And to this they have no reply. Now the latest thing, it is an old, old colonial ploy (coughs) that... When you're having problems internally in an occupied country, you can't believe somehow to bring yourself to believe that people are really hostile to you. And you always say it's an outside force which is doing it. It was the same in Vietnam. It was meant to be China and Russia. The same in Iraq. They're blaming Iran and threatening Iran. Same in Afghanistan. They're blaming the Pakistan army for not doing enough. This is an army which is now in this war lost more soldiers than NATO and killed more people, unfortunately, than NATO inside Pakistan. It's a porous border of 1,200 miles with mountains. Impossible to build a Chinese wall or a Texan fence or an Israeli wall or a Berlin wall. You can't do it. Impossible. People come and go and they're the same people. They speak the same language. They are Pashtuns. Can't be done. So to blame the Pakistanis for not controlling the border is crazy. But that's the way they function. For the last two months now, they've made two big bombing raids inside Pakistan. The last bombing raid some weeks ago killed 13 Pakistani soldiers and a major in the frontier corps. And so you can imagine that there are real tensions and strains within the Pakistani ruling elite. Because what the if and the big debate in the United States is, let's go into Pakistan and sort them out there. Until we sort out the northwest frontier province of Pakistan, by sorting out you mean endless bombing, killings, partial occupation, we will never win the war in Afghanistan. To which the reply is, you will never win the war in Afghanistan full stop, because people don't want you to stay there. And if you actually go and destabilize another country, who knows what will happen? The consequences are unthinkable. So that is essentially what is going on at the moment. But then let's just stop for a minute. What is this occupation in Afghanistan all about? This is not a country rich in oil or natural resources. It is a poor country of 24 million people, extremely poverty-stricken, largely rural, 
with some diamonds, but not enough to justify this sort of violence. So what is it all about? And you know, early on, when some of us said that this whole wave of wars was a war to assert U.S. hegemony, we were told, oh, no, no, you're paranoid, you're paranoid. Now they're saying it themselves. Early this year, <clears throat> or was it late last year, over the last six months or so, the Secretary General of NATO, uh, Joop Schaffer, a Dutch guy, was giving a talk at the Brookings Institute in Washington. At the end of it, they were all pro, by the way, as you can imagine. It was not a very critical audience. But they began to ask him, what the hell are we doing in Afghanistan? Are we there for democracy, good governance? What is it? And for the first time, someone spelt out why they were there. He said, look, it's not good governance, it's not democracy. If necessary, we'll have to do deals with the Taliban. The real reason we're in Afghanistan is because this is a strategically vital part of the world. And he said, you know why? It is directly on the borders with China and Iran and Central Asia. So strategically, we cannot leave Afghanistan. I was astonished because for the NATO Secretary General to actually say that, not a single political leader from the NATO countries rebutted this. And then I got hold of the NATO review because an American friend said, well, if you think this is wild, you better read the NATO review. And it's quite open what they say. This is in the an essay in the NATO Review, which says in the 21st century, NATO must become an alliance founded on the Euro-Atlantic area, but designed to project systemic stability beyond its borders. That we knew. The center of gravity of power on this planet is moving inexorably eastward. The Asia-Pacific region brings much that is dynamic and positive to this world, but as yet the rapid change therein is neither stable nor embedded in stable institutions. Until this is achieved, it is the strategic responsibility of Europeans and North Americans and the institutions they have built to lead the way. Security effectiveness in such a world is impossible without both legitimacy and capability. And that is essentially what they are doing. They have the Arab world, of course, as you know. Billions are spent in security in the Arab world. They're negotiating with the puppet Iraqi government bases in perpetuity in Iraq, which have created big contradictions even within these people. They forced Hamid Karzai in, Iran, uh, in Afghanistan to sign a pact with them saying that they could have bases in perpetuity, not even like Guantanamo in Cuba, in perpetuity, forever. There were riots and demonstrations in every big Afghan city, including Kabul. Big demonstrations. The American embassy was attacked. So then the regime drew back a bit, but not far enough. And for the first time ever in recent history, the Chinese and the Russians organized joint military maneuvers in the region. Never happened before, not even when they were both supposedly communist states. They never had joint military maneuvers. They've had them. The Iranian government put massive pressure on the Afghans, to not to sign the treaty and temporarily impose an economic embargo on Herat and the region there where they're, they're extremely strong. So it's going to be, I mean, there's an element of fantasy in these NATO people, obviously, but that is what the plan is. And that is why they go and that is why they build their bases. And they're obsessed with China. Why are they obsessed with China? Because this is now the workshop of the world economically the structural alteration that's taken place in the world market is largely a result of what the Chinese have been able to achieve as capitalists with a capitalist economy. 
the Far Eastern region, were it ever to unite even in a European Union style arrangement, would sweep the board. And the United States is well aware of this. So the notion that contradictions between capitalist powers were a thing of the past, don't you believe it? What we used to call in the old days inter-imperial contradictions are back, though now they're not so much inter-imperial as inter-capitalist contradictions. With Europe as a large economic bloc but a very weak political power, basically dominated by the United States politically. And Afghanistan and Pakistan, unfortunately, happen to be on the flight path of this imperial strategy. Now, a few words about Pakistan, <clears throat> especially given that this is the anniversary of 68, on which there are other talks I notice at this event. Probably the most successful uprising of 68, the year itself, was Pakistan. Not anywhere in Europe. I mean, you had big things happening here, general strikes. But in terms of actually toppling a dictatorship, what happened in Pakistan in those years was quite astonishing. From, October, from November the 7th, 1968, that was the day the movement began. It was the anniversary of the Russian Revolution, but no one quite knew that. The movement began, erupted, and spread like wildfire all over the country. And each week and each month, the movement grew and grew and grew. Started by students, factory workers joined it, rail workers joined it, lawyers joined it. Every social layer came into this movement, and the demand was social justice, end of feudalism, withdrawal from all the pro-American pacts, and down with the dictatorship. These were the four big slogans of that movement, each one of them excellent in its own way. They killed people. The number of people killed went up and up and up and up. It was the only time in Pakistan's history that the country was united, and united from blow. Never from above, from below. In East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, and West Pakistan, students came out in solidarity with each other. When students were shot in West Pakistan, women students in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, marched out in bare feet in solidarity. A demonstration by 20,000 women students in bare feet and wearing white in mourning. And this movement became undefeatable. And the army began to crack up. And within the army, some of the younger officers said, we can't, it's one thing killing Bengalis in East Pakistan, but don't ask us to kill our own people. And the dictatorship collapsed. I was there when it happened, the day of the collapse of the dictatorship in March 69. The mood was joyous, absolutely joyous. And the big chants and slogans all over that country, the social program was like land, uh, bread in peace. It was food, clothing, and shelter. That was the slogan that was chanted. And when the Islamist groups would chant at that time, what does Pakistan mean? And their particular slogan was, there is only one God and he is God, the, the religious beliefs. But they were a tiny minority. The bulk of the crowds when asked, what does Pakistan mean for you? And people would chant food, clothes, shelter. And, this no, and that Pakistan, of course, disappeared in the bloodbaths in Bangladesh. The military took its revenge, but the country broke up. So the contradictions were so heightened. But people did learn a great deal. They did learn a great deal. Now... So and some memories of that still exist, which is why the People's Party is strong, because its founding leader, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, was one of the politicians who came out with the students, when the traditional left didn't. He came out and won massive support and popularity as a result, and that still maintains that party in power. So this image of Pakistan on the verge, which 
gets me right down because it's so completely false and self-serving that Pakistan is on the verge of a jihadi takeover and the jihadis will soon have their fingers on the nuclear trigger and therefore in order to stop this, the West has to do something. A similar sort of crap they talk about Iran. But in the case of Pakistan, it isn't even true. In the last elections, the religious parties got under 5% of the vote. Under 5%. In the one province where they were strong, they were defeated. <clears throat> they were defeated by a secular party. And even that party, the Awami National Party, which had been sympathetic to the American presence in Afghanistan, has now come out very strongly and denounced them. So it's a situation which is in flux, but one of the big problems we've had in that country is that every single ruling elite, by and large, with the partial exception of when Bhutto himself, the father, was in power, uh, has done American bidding. And, you know, people sometimes ask me, who runs Pakistan? And I say the United States and their Pakistan lobby. There are three big lobbies in Pakistan. The U.S. lobby, which runs the country through the army and its tame politicians. There's the Saudi lobby, which is strong because of the oil wealth and partially religion, less unpopular than the United States. Then there's the Chinese lobby, invisible, invisible, never interferes in the internal politics of the country, but very strong in the army and highly respected by the military elite, highly respected. The problem is there is no Pakistan lobby in Pakistan. <laughs> no lobby of people within the country, on the level of the ruling class I talk about, who have the interests of the country, even in a bourgeois way, at the forefront, who put the interests of their people first. I mean, if you look at what's happening now, the Americans are bombing the northwest frontier province. The price of food has gone up, shot up. 80% of Pakistanis, that's the latest estimate, 80% of Pakistanis say they cannot afford to buy flour each day to make bread or chapatis. They can't afford it. One, you know, we know the food prices have gone up globally, but one reason in Pakistan is that a lot of wheat is being smuggled into Afghanistan to feed the NATO armies. That's what's going on. And a lot of people involved in this smuggling are members of parliament. They're the ones who are doing it, people in power. The pro uh, electricity, the country is without electricity in all the big cities for most of the day, unless you have your own generator. And the social economic situation is extremely grim. And so what we need is a political formation in that country which combines opposition to U.S. foreign policy in the region with a positive plan for reviving the country and the economy and defending the interests of the people of Pakistan. Do you know one of the statistics, I sometimes think nothing shocks me, but one of the statistics that did shock me, I then went and checked out because I go to Pakistan a lot, and everyone said, it's true. So I said, why aren't you screaming? Because people get used to it. Like people in Britain get used to the fact that their troops are in Iraq killing or torturing. People get used to it. And the figure which, the statistic which shocked me was, it's uh, by the United Nations Health Organization, that the height of Pakistanis is now going down. The bulk of the country, the height of the population is decreasing. More people, in, largely in 70% of the country, not 30%, are being born stunted. And my niece told me when I go to buy clothes in the popular markets, my daughter, who is six, 
I have to buy clothes for her which are a much, much larger size because people are being born stunted. And she said she was quite shocked when she discovered this. Now, when you have problems of this sort confronting a country, for the West and its leader writers and its pundits and the people who now write books on Pakistan to ignore all this on the grounds that there is a possible danger of a jihadi takeover, which I think is so remote, the only thing that would make it possible is if the Americans occupied Pakistan. The army would then split. The much-vaunted unity of the Pakistan High Command would crumble. It would crumble. People would be angry, and they would say, enough is enough, being their allies in the so-called war against terror, this is now what we face. Many are saying it already, but privately. So the mess that has been created in that part of the world by the so-called war on terror has affected the country as a whole. This is a country where the education standards are miserable. Miserable compared to India. Forget Europe. Absolutely miserable. It has got one of the most callous, unthinking, and cruel ruling elites I can think of in that part of the world who don't care as long as they have wealth, as long as their children are educated. And some friends of mine were doing a survey in some of the poorest areas of the cities. And they said, you'll be surprised, they said to me. One of the demands when we ask people, what would you like most in this world? They say, uh, they say two meals to eat, obviously. But they also say, we would like our children to be educated. And do you know something? Many of them add, we would like our children to learn English. Why? So, because English in that country is a language, is the total preserve of the elite and the wealthy. Their kids can go out and study. They can learn what they want, and the poor see it, and saying maybe if our kids could speak English, we could send them out to study at least or do something. But the level of education remains extremely low, extremely low. And then why then are people surprised, since the West has more or less run this country, why are people surprised when poor families approached by a a, a cleric and asked, give us one of your children and we'll educate him. They don't ask, what are you going to teach him? All they know is that their kids will be fed, clothed, and given some rudimentary education. Of course, and some madrasas, religious schools, do just that. It's not the case that all of them are breeding grounds for the jihad or any. It's nonsense. But the question is, it's the total dereliction of its duty by the Pakistani state and the Pakistani elite that has created this situation. That is never talked about seriously by Western leaders and Western rulers who go on about Islam being this and Islam being that, and the big problem is uh, uh, these terrorists. It's true, it is a tiny problem. The big problems are much, much larger much larger in scale. And as I say there, we need giant social movements in that country, and one hopes they will arise again. One such movement was the movement by lawyers to reinstate the judges. Why? It wasn't just suddenly that the country said, what we need is a constitutional revolution. This chief justice had actually pushed through remarkable things. He had first said that the privatization of the steel industry was illegal. He had asked for evidence to be brought into the court, and it became clear that the privatization of the Pakistani steel industry was being carried out by the government. Three top government people, Musharraf himself, the prime minister at the time, Shokat Aziz, known as Shortcut Aziz, Shortcut was linked to a company, Musharraf was linked to an Arab conglomerate, and there was a third person. They were buying over the steel industry. This all came out, so naturally the government was not used to judges behaving like this. Then a woman whose son had been disappeared, 
appealed to the Supreme Court through a very, you know, cheap lawyer, cheap in the sense he didn't charge her anything, not a grand lawyer, and said this woman's son has been disappeared. And that did even surprise me. The Chief Justice ordered the head of the Federal Intelligence Agency to appear in court and said, where is this man? And the head of the Federal Intelligence Agency said, we have no idea what you're talking about, sir. We don't know who this woman is. We don't know who the boy is. <clears throat> and the Chief Justice said, either you produce this man before my court within 48 hours or I will have you arrested and locked up. Now, that has never happened in Britain. It's never happened in the United States. But it happened in Pakistan. And within 48 hours, the kid was produced in court. He said, where's the evidence on which you're holding him on charges of terrorism? And he saw the evidence, and he said, there's no evidence. Why did you hold him? The Americans wanted it. He ordered his immediate release. That same day, the British and American government said that the Chief Justice was irresponsible. For, for demanding to see evidence which didn't exist, the Chief Justice of Pakistan, Supreme Court, is held to be irresponsible. So naturally, when he was sacked by a military leader, there was anger. And he did many other things. I can't go into all of them in detail. And that sparked off this social movement led by lawyers, but joined by large chunks of the country, desperate for some leadership, desperate for someone to do something for them, and finding in the Chief Justice a figure who had acted, however indirectly, in their interests. So that is a Pakistan I know and respect quite well. But this is not the Pakistan once he's reported. There's very little coverage of the lawyers' movement in the media here. The contrast between them and some of the jihadi groups who the media here is obsessed with was so strong and so obvious, but there was very little uh, uh, actually uh, reported. And this is a struggle which isn't over. I think it's probably suffered a, a blow with what's going on at the moment. But it's a struggle uh, that isn't over. So to conclude, you know, as in other parts of the world, the entry of the West into these countries creates an even bigger mess. Whether or not you like the governments is neither here nor there. You know, people used to say, but so do you like Saddam? It's not a question of liking or supporting Saddam. It's a question of insisting on one principle, which applies to Iraq, which applies to Afghanistan, which applies to Pakistan, which applies to Somalia, which is this, that change, however long it takes, and it will come, is best brought about organically, because then this change can be lasting. Whereas the intervention by Western armies and Western torturers and NGOs distorts the process and actually creates problems which couldn't even have been conceived before they went in. And the result is that in Iraq today, if you talk to many Iraqis on the street, they will say to you, bluntly, this has been reported, things were better under Saddam. How could they not? It's not that they like him, but they say things were better under him. That's what people are beginning to say even in Afghanistan, when rape shoots up massively, and where NATO soldiers and the mercenaries they hire cannot be brought into an Afghan court and prosecuted. That's what happens. And that is the scale of the problem. And there are no easy solutions, but the one solution which has to be a starting point before anything else can be done is the withdrawal of all foreign troops from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, and of course from Iraq.